And it's wonderful to be here today. It's been a couple of years since I've been here, and I uh, always love to come up to the Annenberg School. I have just written a new book. Um, I put the cover up there, The Global War for Internet Governance, published by Yale University Press. It actually just came out last month, so it was fortunate timing um, you know, to get a nice 2014 date on it. There's nothing happening in the world in internet governance. Um, it, it's, I'm being sarcastic. There's really a lot going on right now. Some of it is real and some of it is imaginary, and I want to talk about the difference between the two today. But I did select a very provocative title for this book uh, with a metaphor around war, because in my opinion, internet governance conflicts are creating new spaces where political and economic power is working itself out in the 21st century. Internet control points, and there are many, are points that mediate civil liberties, such as freedom of expression and privacy. They're entangled in national security. They affect global innovation policy. But the distributed nature of these technologies is somewhat shifting traditional public policy away from sovereign nation states and into new global institutions and into technical design. So that's what I find so interesting about it. This whole area has been historically so technically and institutionally complex that to some extent it's been out of public view and out of the view of policymakers and the media. Not intentionally out of view, but because of the technical complexity and also the privatization. Much of the work of internet governance has been done by private industry and by these new nonprofit corporations such as ICANN, the Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers. So a lot of this doesn't have to do with traditional governments. But several controversies have really brought this issue into the public sphere into, in a way that wasn't the case the last time I was here discussing some, some of these issues. In fewer than four years, we had WikiLeaks releasing diplomatic cables. We had the Cablegate incident. And while most people were studying the content and the information policies around that and the law, what I was interested in were the subterranean battles that ensued in which hosting services took down WikiLeaks, financial services companies disrupted the flow of funds to WikiLeaks, and then in turn we had some hacking groups promulgate denial of service attacks against those companies that took WikiLeaks down. So there was a whole battle there. We also had Hillary Clinton's famous internet freedom speech at the museum down in Washington, D.C., in which she called upon corporations, and in particular United States corporations, to push back against repressive governments that were trying to enact surveillance and censorship of information. And three years later, internet freedom advocates were faced with the cognitive dissonance of trying to look at Hillary Clinton's speech through the lens of the NSA disclosures that Snowden made. We also had the online boycott over the Stop Online Piracy Act. And all of that, that's a four-hour discussion right there of what that was about. But that was uh, very prominent in the media. We've had the Egyptian internet outage. We've had GhostNet. We have the Great Firewall of China revelations. And really too many distributed denial of service attacks to recount. So at the same time that we have every aspect of society and the economy in some way dependent upon cyber infrastructure, we also have somewhat of a loss of trust in the stability of the internet, in the stewardship of governments, and by default some loss of trust in the private institutions that manage the internet. So out of this loss of trust and this concern about cyber security and cyber governance has come a call for political attention around the world to exactly how the internet is controlled. Now one point to make, um, which I always like to make, is that the internet is already governed. But the first chapter of my book is called The Internet Governance Oxymoron because it's not government with, with a capital G but governance with a small g. There are control points that require coordination, sometimes centralized coordination. And what I do is I study these technically mediated control points from three perspectives that Monroe alluded to earlier. I have a, an information engineering background, both educationally and in practice. 
and I have a, a doctoral degree in science and technology studies, and in particular, look at this through the lens of the philosophy of technology and the sociology of technology. And also, um, you know, milled about at Yale Law School for five years and got a good international law perspective on some of this. So therefore, the way I study internet governance extends beyond institutions. It extends well beyond the accounts of policies of nation states to account for um, what is usually described as the rising privatization of global power and also the embedded politics of the actual design, which is my primary research interest. So this starting point either sounds obvious to you or it sounds absolutely controversial. And the internet engineering community does not think this is a popular view because they view what they do as being, well, technical. And if someone else does it, it's political. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a certain asymmetry. Um, so a lot of engineering communities that enact many of these forms of coordination and administration, they think about it as problem solving, as efficiency, and sometimes don't fully acknowledge the public policy role and the, the, what they're doing that affects civil liberties and innovation policy. So that's really why I wanted to write this book, is to uncover some of these issues. Now, the, um, it's also important to say that the governance of the internet and its predecessor networks has existed since 1969. Someone has had to set standards for how computers interact. Someone has coordinated the distribution of unique virtual identifiers, like binary addresses, or names that are necessary to exchange information over the internet. Someone has responded to internet security problems. I was actually at Cornell the year the Morris worm hit in 1988, which was a lot of fun. Someone has responded to those problems. Someone has ultimately selected the values that are designed into the network and into various parts of the network. So, uh, but I often get asked, well, what is internet governance? And the simplest definition I can find uh, that's not so simple is I would say the primary task of internet governance involves the administration and the design of the technologies that are necessary to keep the internet operational. And then the enactment of substantive policy around these technologies. But despite how this is discussed in policy making circles and in the media, there's not a single system of internet governance, which is another point to make. It involves layer upon layer of functions. And there are really a lot of different taxonomies for understanding this. Um, the one that I use is um, what I have on the, the slide here. Um, I'll just go through a, a few examples, actually, just a quick uh, couple of examples of how internet governance carries out functions in these various areas. So one historically contentious area of internet governance is the control over critical internet resources that are necessary for the day-to-day -day operation of the internet. This is usually code for something. It's code for a number of virtual binary addresses like internet protocol addresses that are required to get on the internet and exchange information. It's code for autonomous system numbers. How many people, does anyone in here study anything to do with autonomous system numbers? Okay, it's, um, it's an important virtual resource that is necessary for networks to interconnect. And people control the dissemination of these numbers. And then also um, domain names are usually included in this uh, category of critical internet resources. Now, the requirement that each of these identifiers, IP addresses, domain names, and autonomous system numbers be globally unique has necessitated a certain form of governance and coordination centralized coordination in order to meet this technical requirement of global uniqueness. And the global control over who has that centralized function of coordination or hierarchical function has really been a long-standing contentious issue in internet governance. So this, has been, this discussion has been going on for decade, uh, more than a decade. Power struggles uh, reflect tensions between the US and the United Nations and especially struggles over ultimate control of something called the root zone file, which is the authoritative mapping of top level domains like .com, .edu, .xxx, whatever, and the binary addresses that go along with that. 
Now, there are a number of institutions in this area. It's a, a very um, lengthy discussion to go through all of them. I'll just mention a few, um, as well as the private companies that are involved in the coordination and governance of critical internet resources. Um, and, and of course, the United States Department of Commerce has retained a contractual connection to this area um, in terms of its relationship with ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. But ICANN is a private nonprofit corporation that ultimately has authority for the administration of these critical internet resources. They delegate some of these functions to um, a sub-organization called IANA. Um, I, try, I tried giving a talk about this without acronyms and it's impos impossible, so I apologize. But IANA is just the um, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, which in turn allocates IP addresses to regional internet registries. So we have ICANN, we have the connection with the Department of Commerce, we have the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. We have the delegation to regional internet registries. That's just for the, um, the binary numbers. And then there are hundreds of registrars that hand out um, domain names. Many of you have gone to purchase your own domain name, possibly through GoDaddy. Think of Danica Patrick, um, the spokesperson for GoDaddy, which is just a domain name registrar. So there are hundreds of these. Uh, there's really a gigantic institutional infrastructure that oversees this area. Eyes glaze over when you start to talk about IP addresses. I actually wrote a book that uh, was published in 2009 called Protocol Politics, which is only about IP addresses and specifically about some controversies over um, upgrading to a new standard that would make more of these addresses available around the world. But <laughs> eyes glaze over, but there actually are enormous public policy issues here. What are some of them? Here's one, the issue of adjudicating domain name trademark disputes. Who owns, who should own United.com? United Airlines, United Van Lines, United Arab Emirates. I'm not a sports fan, but Manchester United. There are all kinds of options for this. There is a global system of governance to adjudicate these called the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Process. So it's a, it's a series of, um, it's an infinite regress problem. Well, who accredits the accreditors that, that uh, make the decisions about who should own something? It's a very complicated area. Um, another question is about authorizing new top-level domains. Has anyone followed the controversies over the expansion of top-level domains for the internet, such as .com, .edu, .biz, .uk, and others? Some are country code top-level domains, which are just areas of the internet that are naming systems in order to access certain information. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but think of them as domains of the internet. Well, this, um, this brings, uh, brings up a lot of issues. Someone proposed the top level domain dot Amazon. It was the corporation Amazon. But then countries with the Amazon rainforest within their borders said, wait a minute, maybe we should control dot Amazon. Same thing with, with dot Patagonia. There were controversies over dot wine. So it's, um, it's a very interesting area. There's also the, uh, the problem of privacy implications that are raised by these unique numbers. So not on the name side, but on the number side. There are problems of resource scarcity. There are problems of privacy and problems related to security. So this whole area is both complicated and it's politically charged. Another very technical area is the establishment of technical standards, standard setting. Usually in the internet context, standards are called protocols, which are just the rules that enable devices made by different manufacturers to communicate. And another word is just interoperate, to exchange information, as long as the manufacturers design their systems based on those specifications. Think of them as blueprints for developing technology. Some of you are online right now, um, or you have been today. You've used many of these. Wi-Fi, you've accessed Wi-Fi, maybe used Bluetooth standard. If you were listening to some music, MP3, that's a standard for audio compression. Maybe you used a VoIP, voice over the internet protocol. So we use these, we engage in protocols you know, hundreds of times a day. One individual device can inhabit and incorporate 
hundreds and hundreds of these individual standards, so it's very important. They do serve a critical technical function of establishing interoperability between different devices. Many are set by global standard setting organizations. Can anyone name a couple of the key ones? I won't use the acronyms, but the World Wide Web Consortium, the Internet Engineering Task Force, any one of these areas is, um, has, has a number of policy issues. Who are these people that are setting the standards? Do they set public policy or is it purely a technical issue? Well, when you have a unique identifier that is associated with your computer and that gets embedded in a standard, that raises the privacy question of do we want to have that kind of traceable identity? When you have encryption standards that set a certain key length or security or possibly allow a backdoor for governments to come in and to unlock the encryption, that is a public policy issue. Here's another protocol, BitTorrent. I always ask students, you know, who, I phrase the question this way, who has not illegally downloaded a song? I've never illegally downloaded a song, I just have to tell you. But most, most students have, and videos, and everyone's smiling on that side, I can tell what's going on. Right, so this is, um, oftentimes this is done through peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, which is based on the BitTorrent protocol. This is a protocol that was just designed to facilitate efficient information sharing, but now it's linked with piracy because of the ability to share multimedia um, files so easily. Other standards determine the extent of accessibility for the disabled. So that's a public policy issue. So there, um, I could go on and on with examples of these, but the point I'd like to make is that whereas the design of these protocols has social implications, the procedures by which they're established is a fundamental governance concern. It's related to expertise, it's related to public accountability, transparency, and the basic question of what is the legitimacy of private organizations to enact such policy making. So I mentioned that one. Um, cybersecurity governance, that's a little bit more obvious, uh, beginning with um, the 1988 Morris worm to the more recent Stuxnet code targeting Iranian nuclear control systems. Internet security attacks have been um, increasingly more sophisticated. They're often not what, they're actually, what they actually seem to be about. Denial of service attacks often have a political role. They're a proxy for battles that are going on around the world. And much of the responsibility for cybersecurity rests with the, public, with the uh, private sector. But there are also a lot of policy making roles uh, for traditional governments and also public-private partnerships. How, does anyone here study computer emergency response teams or CERTs? This is, um, it's an area of institution there are hundreds of these around the world that have a role in responding to security threats, issuing patches for problems, and um, incredibly fascinating area. There is now an entire area of cybersecurity called zero-day exploit markets. So what this is, is I'm going to oversimplify it. It's the stockpiling of knowledge, not, not of code, but it's the stockpiling of knowledge about vulnerability in various forms of software. And there's a big industry that's forming around this. And this information, it, whereas it used to be given to manufacturers and, and they would be told, there's a vulnerability in your, whether it's Oracle or Microsoft Office, instead of that, now there are stockpiles of this information being uh, traded. So that's a really interesting area of cybersecurity. Of course, there's the separate area of securing the infrastructures of internet governance, like systems of routing, like internet addresses, and uh, like the domain name system itself that maps names into numbers. Um, now, interconnection governance, I like to mention that one because it's something that a lot of people um, don't study yet or don't know a lot about. Why is that? Because it's usually interconnection is, well, let me start by saying this, the obvious, the internet is not actually a cloud. You know, I use a cloud in some of my slides, but it's obviously not actually a cloud. It is a series of interconnected networks 
They connect at these internet exchange points or bilateral connection points. There are buildings that you could walk into with servers, with interconnection cables, with switches, raised flooring, air conditioning, and a vending machine with Cokes and Snickers in it and people working in it. There, there's a physicality to the internet and interconnection is part of that physicality. Now the arrangements in which private companies interconnect establishes policy because they, make, they, they can serve as points of censorship. I think Ron Diebert in, from Toronto made a really good case for that, an um, empirical case for that in his book Black Code. It is an economic issue because who is allowed to interconnect and who's allowed to charge the other company money for that interconnection. So that's an important economic issue related to the growth of the internet and to also to censorship and also to um, basically just innovation policy. Then I usually get into the, I have a chapter of this in the book, I'll just say a few words about it, the policy role of private information intermediaries. What's a private information intermediary? Maybe not the best term for it, but I just mean platforms that don't provide content, but that facilitate content in some way. So search engines, information aggregation sites like Flickr and YouTube, reputation engines like Yelp, like Angie's List, they establish public policy. What would be an example of that? Oregon Bakery refuses to make a, a cake for a lesbian couple that's getting married. On the Yelp review site, people go in there and start slamming the cakes. Um, there's a whole discourse happening around same-sex marriage. And so Yelp, the reputation engine, has to make a decision about what's allowed on the site or isn't. And there's, there, there's the whole issue of um, algorithms behind these rating engines too. So I like to mention that as an area of public policy. And then finally, um, an area that's really of great interest to me, that is the question of how intellectual property rights are increasingly mediated through technical architecture. So the intersection of copyright, trademark, even trade secrecy, and the underlying architecture of the internet. Now, this, uh, there are a number of issues here. The traditional notice and takedown procedures, there's also the turn to the domain name system for copyright enforcement, where, for example, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement arm of the Homeland Security Department will approach an internet registry that runs a certain part of the domain name system, and they'll say, please block access to, just making up a site here, louisvuittonknockoffs.com. They'll block, they'll have them block the site. So the domain name system is increasingly being used for trademark and copyright enforcement. And of course there's the issue of intellectual property rights that are embedded in the actual systems of internet governance. I mentioned one before, trademark enforcement and domain names. There's also the question of standards-based patents and then trade secrecy in things like search engine algorithms. So that's a very rich area. I go through these examples because um, I wanted to just mention that my book uses this framework and it describes what is at stake in these various areas of internet governance. What I want to do now though is to just mention a few common characteristics of some of these internet governance trends. Three themes, just picking out three themes from the book. One, and this is a theme underlying all of the research and work that I've done, is that arrangements of technical architecture are always arrangements of power. This complex institutional and technical scaffolding that I mentioned is behind the scenes to a certain extent. And it's not visible to end users in the same way that content and applications are visible but they nevertheless embed political and cultural tensions. Uh, two STS scholars in, in my field, Jeff Bowker and the late Susan Lee Starr, have explained, and I just want to read a quote from them, inverting our common sense notion of infrastructure means taking, taking what have often been seen as behind the scenes, boring, 
background processes to the real work of politics and knowledge production in bringing their contribution to the foreground. This is from infrastructure studies. So bringing infrastructures of internet governance to the foreground reveals the politics of this architecture, whereby technology and social order are produced contemporaneously. Now, internet governance decisions certainly do involve uh, scientific reasoning and efficiency and techno technical design, but they also implicate these uh, social considerations. I mentioned a few of these already, um, like the design of IP addresses and the global uniqueness around that has necessitated a certain form of centralized governance. Internet protocols are political in their design and in their effects. Even very routine network management functions, like of managing the flow of traffic over an access network, can set policy and can have political effects when it relies on invasive content inspection techniques like deep packet inspection that bring up considerable privacy issues. So changing the, with this backdrop in mind, and again, sometimes it's not popular in the engineering communities, but with that background, we, ha we know that changing the architecture changes the power relationships and creates possibilities for both different forms of governance but also for in unanticipated outcomes. The second theme I wanted to mention is this question of internet governance um, infrastructure and systems increasingly being a proxy for content control and for other political issues. Traditionally dominant forces like governments and media uh, producers have lost control over content to a certain extent. Media companies have certainly lost control over the monetization of content because of piracy. Repressive governments have lost control of the tight, you know, in some societies have lost some control over uh, censorship and, and control of information. Traditional intellectual property rights enforcement has become a problem using law enforcement that targets an individual or targets specific content so instead, what's happening is all of this is descending into the architecture. Not surprisingly, interest has turned to terminating access, to using the domain name system to block entire sites, to block financial flows, if any, to sites, or blocking entire websites by taking down um, hosting services. So this is something that is a general trend that's happening where traditional law enforcement or traditional power over content is diminishing, there are opp opportunities to go into the infrastructure to regain some of this control. I wanted to mention a third theme, and that has to do with the privatization of governance. I always say that internet governance is about governance and not necessarily about governments. Obviously, governments perform many critical functions over um, oversight of the internet, regulating antitrust, computer fraud and abuse. If I have identity theft problem, I would like the government to step in and help me. Intellectual property rights enforcement, national security, regional, national policies on privacy, in some cases international treaties on certain issues like intellectual property rights. So there's, there's really a lot that government is involved in. But really most key internet governance functions have not been the domain of governments, but they have been executed by private ordering, by the design of technology, and new institutional forms that are international in nature and that are not necessarily tied to any one particular government or series of governments. Private companies perform an enormous role too. VeriSign is a company that is a, they do a lot of different things, but one of the things they do is they're a registry that runs um, the .com domain, for example. So there's this private functioning. Private telecommunication companies make up the majority of the Internet's backbone. They have these agreements to conjoin via private contractual arrangements. So private corporations are enacting policy not only in carrying out their core functions, but also responding to what's happening on a global political stage. So there's delegated censorship to private companies. 
There is the question of making decisions about what information to take down. Remember when the Innocence of Muslims video came out? Google had to make a decision about whether or not it would take down that video. This is a private decision. And when you look at the transparency reports that some of these companies publish, you start looking at the data, you realize that they're not just blindly meeting every request that governments ask. There's a, uh, there's a disconnect, there's a gap between the requests from governments and what they actually do. So in that gap is where their governance is being en enacted to decide what information to take down, what data disclosures to give about, uh, about individuals and other kinds of gover governance uh, mechanisms. So delegated censorship, delegated surveillance, delegated copyright enforcement, delegated law enforcement, have shifted the governance function for better or worse to these private intermediaries. So that's a major theme that I take up in the book. So the bottom line is that much internet governance either originates in the private sector or is delegated to the private sector, which uh, really brings up a lot of questions about legitimacy and the future of global governance structures. So what time, um, should, do I have a little bit more time? I didn't, I neglected to ask. It, sounded a little bit closer to the theme of global internet uh, war, or governance. But, and so I thought maybe you could talk a little about the profile of competition for governance among, among the regions. Absolutely. Um, I, absolutely. I think that would be a good way to use my remaining time, and then I would really love to open it up to questions and have a dialogue. Um, so let me, um, let me just describe what Monroe is saying. I, I also wear another hat right now. I'm the director of research for the Global Commission on Internet Governance, which is being chaired by Carl Bildt, the former prime minister of Sweden. And it involves um, a lot of people you know, ranging from academics to um, prominent politicians to people who are prominent in corporations. And the idea, it's a two-year initiative, and the idea is to ask the question, you know, what are the actual problems of internet governance that need to be responded to? and come up with a strate strategic vision. Uh, so what can go wrong, right? That, that's one question that's being asked. What, what was the demand for this commission? Where, in other words, the, this commission, then there was the OECD. There are a number of other efforts to do a similar kind of thing. Right, and the OECD is um, involved in this initiative. But the, um, what was the demand for this? I'm going to put it in my own words, OK? I'm going to use my, right, I'm going to just use my own words, right. There, there's a tremendous amount of confusion over what the actual debates are and what is at stake in the future of internet governance. But I think it's safe to say that repressive governments really have their act together in terms of what their strategy is for governance of the internet and intersecting with the private sector. Because of the nature of democracy, I would say that the, um, let me just rewind that. Let me put it this way. I think that there's not yet a liberal democratic vision of what internet governance should look like, partly because it's so complicated. So that brings up the question of, well, what are the problems that need answers? What are the threats that can come up? Um, let me use my remaining time by describing a couple of these. Might even have a picture here. OK, well, we'll go with that picture, and I'll talk around it. OK, so one question is the notion of internet universality. We don't really have an, a universal internet now in some ways. If you don't speak English, you see an entirely different internet than other people. There are cultural barriers. There are digital divide issues. So I would say we really don't fully have a universal internet. However, the technical affordances of the internet, the standard setting, the various aspects of interconnection provide a certain degree of, uh, of universality at the technical level. One response to the NSA disclosures is potentially moving us towards fragmentation of the internet. So I have a, a picture of the, um, uh, the president of Brazil here, because Brazil is, ha came out with a statement pushing US companies to store Brazilian customer data in Brazil. 
data localization. We also have, it's a great new term, data localization. And you know, the technical reality is much more complicated than, the way, than how it's, it's not that easy to localize data. All, another example, German telecommunication companies, after the Snowden revelations, proposed the development of walled, a walled off internet designed to stop NSA spying at the borders. We have a, an, an European Commission, it's not a proclamation, a statement coming out of the European Commission, which you probably read about this morning. There's a, a good article in the Wall Street Journal about this, about um, the desire among the European Union to take control, United States control, away um, in certain areas, like in ICANN. So we have all of these questions that are coming up that bring up the question of, will the internet at the technical level remain a universal internet or will it be fragmented? It's not just the response to NSA. Okay, there are other huge issues here. And I do feel that this is a problem. And again, this is just me talking, not the Global Commission. I feel that there are a lot of trends that are taking us away from interoperability and the ability of um, devices to exchange information in the way that it's happened in the last 10 years. So think about the last 30 years. We've made a very difficult move from proprietary systems in which networks couldn't communicate. You had IBM Systems Network Architecture Protocols. You had DEX, DECnet. You had Apple's Apple Talk. And if you had these different networks, you could not communicate with each other. They were based on proprietary systems. We also had proprietary online systems. AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy. And it was a pretty difficult switch to go from that to interoperability. But um, I, I feel that a major problem is that we have trends taking us away from that interoperability and movements towards uh, proprietary protocols. There are many examples of this. In fact, some popular platforms design proprietary protocols into their, into their platforms. Even something like Skype, which I love to use, has some proprietary protocols built in, and you have to use a billing arrangement to unlock the interoperability. If this is how text and web-based communication and email was done, we wouldn't have the open internet that we have today. So there's a movement towards, um, towards proprietary standards. I want to mention that as a global problem that needs to be responded to. Um, okay, I'm going to talk around about anonymity. This is a, just in direct, in direct answer to your question, Monroe. Remember this New Yorker cartoon, uh, famous in the 1990s? It's the internet surfing dog with the caption on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Well, today everyone knows you're a dog and who you're talking to, right? But it, at the time, the initial technical affordances of the internet were such that it seemed to normatively promote the possibility for anonymous communication. And I know some people in this room do great work on the connection between democracy and um, in anonymity. At a minimum, there was traceable anonymity. So you had anonymity on the surface, but law enforcement could request certain information from an internet service provider or, or other network intermediary and then find out something about you. But at the content and application level, and this is a very important point, there are trends away from anonymity. Some, we know this is the case in social media where there are policies and commentary spaces in the news that require individuals to use real name identification. In cyber cafes in Brazil and India, it's common practice to require the presentation of an ID in order to gain access to the internet, and that's how a lot of people gain access to the internet. Chinese authorities are contemplating a policy to prohibit digital anonymity and to require, even at the content level, in identification in order to get online. So the trend, the trend is a way towards anonymity. Um, there are natural, so what did I just say? There are national statutes, mandates for real identification. There are uh, social media policies that require real name identification. And then some cultural pressure for real identification over concerns about cyberbullying and other types of things. So that's a trend. But apart from those content and application-based shifts, there also is this subterranean identity infrastructure that is being collected about us. It's the Faustian bargain, as um, Michael Zimmer, a privacy expert at University of Wisconsin, describes. It's a Faustian bargain where we use free software 
and in exchange for that, there's a identity infrastructure that's collected about us. The only reason that governments ha remotely have access to all of this information is because this is the data identity and infrastructure that's collected about us. So look at the types of things that are, are collected. This is a very simple slide, but it has a lot on it. IP addresses, unique software attributes on a computer, addresses that are linked directly to hardware, locational issues, who we connect to, mobile phone hardware device identifiers, and of course our own uh, phone number. So this is, um, th this is a question that I like to raise, and that is a question that can be taken up in a global commission. Do we want this shift? How does the commission resolve it? In other words, these are issues that we've known are issues. They've been resolved in different ways. So the question is, what's peculiarly representative about this commission that gives it legitimacy? The commission has not yet met. No, this I, commission, I, I, so I, we're, we're it's we're going to be a two-year initiative, yes. We're, we're a world of fiction here. Yes. I'm, I'm, but I'm using it as an example. Right. In other words, what, what gives a, a commission legitimacy to decide this question or to make it can certainly make a recommendation. Um, so well, the... What okay, in this, I'll just speak to this particular, in this particular commission, I'll just speak to what will it look like at the end. There's not going to be an intergovernmental proclamation. There will be a report that will be in the name of the chair, Carl Bilt. So it's going to be a report that, the, the first question is going to be identifying some of these issues that can, and then asking the realistic question of what can be achieved. So I, I share your question that that's the very first thing that has to be asked, what can be achieved. I think that something can be achieved in the area of um, security. I think something can be achieved in the area of interconnection um, because we have some very real political pressure in areas like that. Um, whether something can be achieved in privacy, I think that's possible. Um, that's, that's a much larger question and it's much more complicated because of the different cultural norms around that. But just let's look at one other specific issue. Western Europe and the U.S. Does it include China and Russia? <coughs> this particular commission is um, tries to be representative of different regions, but it doesn't include all countries, obviously, okay. because it's right, right. But that um, that question that Monroe is asking is a, a very valid question of, you know, what are the big open issues, and is it is there any possible for international cooperation in answering these issues, and if so, where is the legitimacy? I think one of, and again, this is just, um, I'm going to conclude and then totally open it up to questions uh, with just by flagging one other issue that I think can be, um, maybe not can be, but should be tackled. And that is this question of shifts to interconnection. Who's heard is another acronym of the WICKET. There was a World Conference on International Telecommunication. And there were some proposals going into that. It was, a, it was really just a discussion to tackle the question of something called the International Telecommunication Regulations, which is um, a long-standing treaty that has to do with how telecommunication providers connect. And it is overseen by the International Telecommunication Union, which is a sub-agency of the United Nations. One of the proposals going into that was the idea of incorporating or pulling the internet underneath the international regulations, dealing with some content specific things like spam. And also there was a proposal to call for something called sending party pays. Sending party pays is the notion that a content company like Google, the, let me ask it in the form of a question, why shouldn't a content company like Google pay a telecommunications provider who's carrying a lot of their data in YouTube videos, or why shouldn't Hulu pay a telecommunication provider? So that question is a really big one and I think would change the nature of interconnection if instead of having these contractual agreements where the companies themselves are determining how to connect, you mandate that content companies suddenly pay. I think that that would change. That would call for a lot of decisions on the content companies about where they would be doing business around the world. So I just flag these as a few open issues. Um, in, the, in the final chapter of my book, I mention about 10, 10 things that I think of as open issues. Uh, final thought, and it has to do with this term multi-stakeholder. 
So the way that internet governance is described is as multi-stakeholder internet governance, where you have governments, private industry, and what's usually described as civil society coming together to make decisions about things. And I have been so frustrated with the term that I decided to write a little paper called um, Rethinking, Thinking Clearly About Multi-Stakeholderism. Because when you ask that question about how do you get multi-stakeholder governance of something, you have to be talking about one thing. Like, what is the one function? And what's happening is that all of internet governance is being viewed as a monolithic system. And then these questions asked in various fora about how do you get multi-stakeholder governance of the internet? Who should control the internet? The United Nations, the United States, or maybe Google, or ICANN. But the, if you view internet governance as a multi-layered system that is much more technically subtle than that, and also institutionally subtle, then that question doesn't make sense from its first instance. You have to ask the question of what kind of governance is necessary in each particular area. So I feel that that's an important caveat in these discussions about internet governance, to make it a little bit more grounded in technical reality and grounded in a knowledge of where these points of control are. So those are my remarks that I wanted to make. Um, if, I, I like to end with um, a quote from Vint Cerf. A lot of people are very concerned with proposed changes to structures of internet governance. And I think that they have some rationale for being concerned because we often take for granted the relative stability of the internet and we certainly take for granted the stability of internet governance institutions and infrastructures. And changes to those institutions and changes to the technology are going to have implications. So it's very important to be careful before making sweeping changes. So thank you very much for listening and I would just love to hear some comments and some questions. So thank you very much. Uh, it's like a little more specific to the broader issues that you raised or not. You mentioned that you know these uh, private intermediaries, they would have their own criteria of judging I mean, whenever they get a request from a law enforcement agencies or a government that which, you know, which request to abide by. So what are the yardsticks or, uh, you know, what, what are their, you know, on uh, the basis on which they make the judgments on uh, what call to take? And uh, does it is it like a local issue that you know they would it could depend on you know from which government is it coming from or is, is there like a you know general um, you know guidelines for that? It's uh, did everyone hear the question? The question is um, on what basis do private information intermediaries make decisions about when to acquiesce to government requests for user data or for that matter for censorship or other kind of action? versus when do they push back against it, right? Um, one of my doctoral students is actually writing her dissertation on that topic, um, and it's, um, it's, all, it's all across the board. There are various criteria, and it's constantly changing, but some of it has to do with uh, the individual regulations in each country, right, and meeting the law, you know, just abiding by the law in a country. And where it's more ambiguous than that, there's the question of whether there is judicial review and a variety of um, factors that relate to corporate norms, and I don't like this term, but corporate social responsibility and statements by corporations about what they will do and what they won't um, in their ever constantly shifting policies, uh, privacy policies that we can all read and uh, should read. So it's a combination of norms and gut feel in some cases, uh, whether there is a judicial review where the originating authority is, you know, the legitimacy of that. So, for example, if it's a local, what's the right way to, to phrase this? If it's a, like a local magistrate that is weighed really differently in some cases than a, uh, a judicial uh, requirement, you know, a judge ordered uh, warrant to hand something over. So it has to do with who's the issuing agency, the different contexts. There's not an easy answer to that. And I think in some ways that it needs to be worked out. Yeah. Did you want to, did someone else, do you want to ask a? So I think that, do you think well, that 
don't you reflect on countries that you're familiar with? I mean, you, you probably have your own answer to this question. Yeah, I think that it could be a little, I mean, in the uh, Indian context, probably it could be a little, uh, you know, uh, it could be a little more um, informal mechanisms by which it would work, because... Um, what the, company are, are, are you talking about, first because, of all? Because uh, the, the Google had recently released uh, this uh, data on the request that they had received from the different governments across the world. And, whether the uh, whether there was like a request for political contents to be withdrawn from the uh, from from the uh, web and uh, you're talking it, about censorship then yeah it was like the issue on the ground of uh, national security so uh, the I don't remember like which which year was the uh, that particular report it showed that it uh, in in many cases it's like there were many requests from the uh, so-called liberal democracies of the world that, you know, United States, the it had given so many requests uh, and uh, the Guru had actually abided uh, in taking down those particular content that had got to do with the national security or... So they, they also sometimes have to do with defamation and issues like that as well, right? And there's a whole question of taking down copyrighted content. So that's a separate question of what is being taken down, but I think... It, you know, do you have any insights into what the criteria are that the corporations use um, in, in, when dealing with India? I think that it could be, I, I, I kind of felt that it could be like uh, nation states probably would have a larger role to play in this because uh, in the South Asian context, uh, context, it was more to do with the issue of uh, the national security. That was a major uh, um, on, on that background, there were more requests that came. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, maybe you collected your thoughts. Oh, as much as I can be. <laughs> uh, Laura, I really enjoyed that. It's a real pr privilege Thank to you. hear you present all that. Um, as you know, I'm also fascinated in these kinds of things. And I'm going to be one of the first people to buy the book as soon as it's available to be bought and read it. Um, I was reflecting. It's outside for sale. It's outside. <laughs> 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 I was reflecting on the contrast, I think, that's implicit in some of the things you said between a notion that change, as it happens in and around all of these multi-layered dimensions of government, governance, is very incremental in some respects. It's either you know, not, no change or incremental change, contrasted with the notion that it might be possible to make sweeping changes. And what I mean by that is, can you comment a little bit on the not only the legitimacy of any entities that are currently in existence, including this new commission that's being set up, and their authority, or their claim to authority, and their capacity to actually speak in a way that some entities somewhere would take note and make change, whether they had come from the public sector or the private sector, et cetera. Because in all of these areas, <coughs> as you say, to change something has sweeping consequences, but the notion that sweeping change in this particular industry around all the protocols, et cetera, could actually happen in a global environment always seems to me to be um, on the edge of unimaginable because of the coordination costs that are involved and the politics. So if you could just reflect on that bundle of issues, it would be really interesting. Absolutely, yeah. that's. That's the crux right there. And I would, um, I would almost separate it into two prongs. One is the actual practice of internet governance and the, how you find legitimacy there. And then discussions about internet governance and on what basis is there legitimacy to discuss or make recommendations. And in that area, um, I think that there, it, it's not so much wanting sweeping changes, but some, some of these entities that are discussing it don't want sweeping changes, like they're afraid of what could happen with that. But come, starting with the notion of where internet governance actually occurs, it, people are throwing meat over, to, I don't know why I use that analogy, to the, the, like the internet governance forum and these kinds of talking shops that are discussing internet governance. And if you read about it, and a lot of people study this, including a lot of communication scholars and the discourses and what counts as um, multi-stakeholder discourse around internet governance. They're writing about it as if it's actual internet governance and it's not. 
But where the actual internet governance is, like interconnection arrangements, standard setting, critical internet resource management, and these kinds of things, um, how do you get legitimacy for these institutions to set policy? I think it's different for every area, and I'll just I'll give you my own opinion about one area. In the area of standard setting, we're never really going to have a lot of civic engagement in standard setting. And there, you have mostly private companies that send people to standard setting organizations, and they make these policies. So I think that, there, that the maximum legitimacy that you can get out of a standard setting organization is to have openness in the development of the standard, openness in its implementation, and openness in its use. So each of those can be unpacked in a way. So open in its development means that anyone is allowed to have a voice and to come and participate. Anyone is allowed to read the minutes and uh, the, the deliberations around the development of a standard. And anyone is allowed to have uh, due process, you know, a lot of democratic, you know, traditional democratic mechanisms. That sounds really obvious, but there are a lot of standard setting organizations that are quite closed. So that's openness in its development that kind of transparency and the ability for people to inspect the standards is part of what gives some democratic legitimacy to those processes. Open and implementation has to do with whether the standard itself, which is not software code and it's not hardware, it's a, it's a blueprint, it's something you can read, whether that is openly published so that it can be read, so that academics who study it can read it, so that policymakers can access it, but most importantly, so that um, economic competition can occur. And anybody can take the ball and run with it and have these documents. Monroe and I might decide to have a complete change in career as we get older and we might start a company and take some of those specifications and start developing products. So that's a certain degree of, of openness. And again, not every standard setting organization has that. And then if you have all that, then openness and use usually ensues where you have multiple competing products. So that's to, that, this is in an area that's highly privatized, but that, that's, I think, the best that we can do in, in terms of having um, legitimacy. That is very, a uh, very important topic. Yes? When and how did legitimacy get totally connected to openness, transparency, participation? I mean, you might say legitimacy exists because the standard setting organization was good, but the fact that it's standards that came out with right. and it had Yeah, expertise so, based, right? Expertise. So you're still you're still in the environment in which these are the important uh, indicators of legitimacy. Is, is that necessary? I think I think it is necessary. I think the expertise is uh, based model is necessary too. But I'll I'll quote somebody who worked for the state government in Massachusetts when they, had, um, a, when they had a policy to adopt open standards. And he said, it's a fundamental imperative, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's a fundamental imperative of democracy that we not lock up public documents in proprietary formats that may be inaccessible in the future. Having, having openness in the specifications is um, often linked to that kind of um, public legitimacy. Yes. Um, putting that into the geopolitical context, though, what seems like a nice idea for actors, private or public, in the Western democracies may actually seem antithetical to what seems like a good idea to other states. So insofar as there is a, a real geopolitics to this, as there was, for example, in the whole debate we heard about over uh, moving from IP4 to IP6 in the not just about whether the standards might be open or that sort of thing. So, in so far as even if the Western democracies were to move incrementally towards greater transparency in the interest of openness, how does that fit with, in quotes, the rest of the world? And I, actually, I think it is in Japan, where there may be less of a commitment to civil society in some way. Maybe there should be more, but. Uh, so I, I think the question is: is this, is this way of speaking about it a you know consistent with a commission that is trying not to pick on a commission, but uh, is it a starting point that, that fences off the sports? Absolutely. A again, we're in the discussion area of actual internet governance and not discussions of internet governance. And in this actual practice of internet governance, 
in many cases, it's not tied to territory, to, to geopolitical territory, territory at all. And it, it's definitely, the, you know, to a great extent, that's the case in standards that are, you, so TCP IP is a standard that is used all throughout the world that was developed and is continually developed by the Internet Engineering Task Force. And it's not tied to any geography. And there aren't any governments that are saying, um, you know, we need, we need to go in there and change TCP IP or anything like that. But there are things that governments can do to promote certain standards over other standards, right? Um, in some parts of the world, governments are the largest procurers of information and communication technologies, for example, and can vote with the dollars. They can send people to standard-setting organizations. But for the most part, and that's why this is such an interesting area and so complicated, as you so well described, you have um, these technologies that completely transcend international boundaries and not, are not necessarily tied to ge geopolitical boundaries. So that's what's... Um, it's a challenge in every area. And I keep coming back to that this is not one area. It's multiple areas. And I just use the example of standard setting. Now, the, the uh, separate question is the discussions about internet governance. There's a, a discussion coming up in Brazil in April that people are going to. How, what's going to come out of that? That's the same question. Of yes. Question. What, right. I mean, Anyway, well, Ben has a question yes. I want to ask him, and then I'm going to yes. call on Ben for his reaction. Um, so how do these, all these uh, global um, internet governance communities, I, I imagine there are many of them, right, commissions and committees, um, how do these communities view this relationship between, you know, internet security, cyber security, and internet openness, internet freedom? national security, cyber security. Right. Thank you. So your question is about the discussions about internet governance. Yeah, the relationship right. or the tension between freedom of speech online, internet freedom, and internet surveillance and cyber security. Right. So which discussion, uh, like the internet governance forum or the ICANN panels that are going on? Or in general. In general, general. It, yeah, in general it's... Yes, the question it's, is, yes. is security trump openness uh, across the board, or, or in some way, that is a... Right. So I'll, I'll give you... There, right? there are security, always conflicting values, no right. In the name of security, right. So that trumps the freedom to the parliament and how this uh, right. the, uh, global governance community view this. Well, there's an interesting thing that happens, and you're absolutely right that there are global values and contention through all of this, whether it's law enforcement versus privacy or security versus freedom of expression, you know, all of these tensions or innovation versus access to knowledge. Um, so that, so there, it's all in tension, which is another big theme in Internet governance. But here's one thing that's happening. I don't think that the two are being brought together very well at all. I really don't. I think that that is um, it's a conundrum of what is the appropriate balance between security and some of these other issues. And part of the reason it's so difficult to bring them together is that the security, national security issues are so territorially bound and some of these other issues transcend the, the boundaries. It's, it's very difficult to bring them together. And what tends to happen, and I actually was speaking, I, I said this openly to a Washington Post reporter this morning, so I'll just sit and say it here, is that there are concerns about things like surveillance. But then the people who are concerned about that say, so what we need to do is tackle how the root zone file is managed. Do you see what I'm saying? So, that, so there, are, there are symbolic power struggles. There are real power struggles. But then where do you point the intervention? And I think you know, just to capture the values and tension that you're talking about, often what happens in practice is that instead of tackling the real issue, something is addressed that is not related to it, but that is more symbolic or maybe something that can be tackled. So I think we're going to see even more of that. And so there are a lot, of, um, a lot of tensions and a lot of conflict. What does the root zone file have to do with surveillance? You can make a few connections. <laughs> you know, it, it's, a it's a centralized mechanism, but really, I'm just thinking about this, the, what the European Commission came out and said. 
data localization have to do with surveillance? Data localization, you can argue, has something to do with surveillance because if you can, if you can create an island, you know that is has certain, you know, is protected in certain ways. You could keep outside inspection from coming in, but the, but it doesn't make any sense at a technical level, which is I think what you're saying, Monroe. The way that information is broken up into packets and distributed in different ways, and um, things are cached around the world, and content distribution networks. It just you know, yeah, the technical reality doesn't match uh, what seems like a reasonable reaction to have this localization. So I, that's, that's a very interesting issue that you raise. Ben. Hi, um, thanks for that. Hello, Ben. How are you? Uh, I didn't you? see you over there. Uh, thanks for a fantastic presentation. It's, I think the book is uh, a good example of the difficulty of working on these issues where you've come up with one wonderful book and so many things have happened in the next uh, in the last six months that you need to start a new research project to tackle all that. So there's sort of a lot of a lot of things that are changing very very fast. Um, what I find specifically interesting about sort of the the link between what you were saying is sort of um, issues that are being invented or sort of uh, put into the public policy debate that aren't necessarily directly related to them is a general breakdown of trust in existing institutions. And so it almost seems like that all of the new commissions that have sprung up last year, this year, there's, there's many of them. There's the, the ICANN panels as well. The ICANN panels, the enhanced cooperation. There's like probably somewhere between half a dozen and a dozen commissions and groups, committees, to somehow discuss where this is going forward. They tend to be mainly staffed, for the most part still, by lots of um, Europeans and North Americans. And that's perhaps still sort of sort of a recognition of the fact that those are the sort of parties that have the most to lose. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the struggle going on is how much, especially North American, but also European corporations, will be willing to give up power or to cede power to third actors. And it's not necessarily so much governments that are involved in that as sort of private sector day-to-day -day governments and also just expertocratic uh, governance structures, which have been used to ruling the internet for so long and are now challenged by global politics and they're not sure what to do What do you mean it. by they're ruling the internet? Uh, they're yeah, ruling in the sense that they are making day-to-day -day decisions. Very simple things. You were mentioning the certs before. So the sort of the, the, the people who make the day-to-day -day decisions about how the internet actually works and runs, and they've become used to, through their expertise, making those core decisions. But they've also become used to earning a good salary working for a large multinational, which in turn profits from their control. And so I, I'd be interested to, to see how those What's the link essentially between your book and the new project? How can those, those institutions that have expertocratic knowledge and have a lot of deep embedded information in them transition? How can they do that legitimacy transition into a sort of new world where they're then expected to justify themselves, not just to their users and to the corporations they work for, but also to the global public? And that's what's so interesting about this then, is that there, these issues are not new. They're not, um, Milton Mueller's book, Ruling the Root, came out in, does anyone remember 2002? Janet Abate, Inventing the Internet, came out in 1999 when she said, protocols are politics by other means. There's been the whole you know, lengthy World Summit on the Information Society pro uh, process, as, as you know, uh, that made a, uh, made a recommendation to take some United States power away from the, the ICANN connection. There have been, these battles have been going on all along, and you and I have been in the rooms, right? So there's, there's really nothing new here. I, again, I want to point to Ron Debert's book, where he uncovers a lot of these surveillance issues, and it came out before the Snowden revelations. Remember shortly after 2000, and, uh, after the September 11th terrorist attacks, when it came out that in AT&T, I can't remember the, the specifics of what the facility was, but it, w it was an AT&T facility in which basically it was like a fire hose um, mirroring data and sending it in to computers that would allow for government surveillance. We knew this was happening, and there wasn't the kind of reaction that there is now. That, that's not a new issue. Maybe the sc you could argue that the scale and scope is new. The issue of United States control over the route, not a new issue. Problems with cybersecurity, not a new issue. So when you do a project like this, um, and I've read all of your work, and I know you do this very well, it's, it's historically grounded, right? It's historically grounded. It's not a moment in time. But I, I would argue that, uh, that what has changed is that 
many of these tensions that have existed all along during the globalization of the internet and the globalization of the process of internet governance have come into the public consciousness in a way that had, has never occurred before, including in the media consciousness and also in front of policymakers. So the, the same things that were at stake before are at stake now. But I would also say that another thing that has changed is that the internet is so much more integral to our day-to-day -day life now than um, in 1999. So on one hand, you have these battles that have been going on all along, these revelations that have been going on all along, the, the evolution of technology, the decisions that are being made. But you know, we didn't have our iPhones uh, in 1999, and we didn't have um, you know, e basic mechanisms of our economy and social life embedded in the technology in the same way we have now. So it's appropriate that there is so much attention. Hello. Yeah, that's really terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the Internet of Things, and specifically, I have two questions. One, what kind of cha challenges does it present with respect to allocating resources, like assigning names and numbers, spectrum, and also setting standards? And then uh, the second question is, what do you think are the leading visions for what the Internet of Things should be among the stakeholders who are either investing to build it out, like Cisco, IBM, and Intel, and then the potential? customers or clients of these types of services, whether that be PayPal and the mobile commerce type of organizations or governments, public service, these types of things. That's a very important topic and I, I, yes, I, I think you should. I, there hasn't been a lot of work done in that area. I think we can say that um, it's going to raise new governance issues, some of the same but also new ones. and. It's going to change the way we interact with technology in a way that brings up new privacy issues and um, identity infrastructures. We probably will, um, we probably won't have a device anymore. So we won't have the device. We'll have everything embedded, right? Like things will be embedded and permeated around us in a way that is much more transparent. That's more tied in with biometric identification. Uh, the obvious big governance issue there is uh, the privacy implications of this and how it ties into biological identity and location and things like that. Another whole area of governance has to do with whether the same interoperability will occur in these kinds of networks. Um, we already see in cloud computing that we don't have the same kind of interoperability that we have in other areas of the web, for example. So I imagine that that would be an issue that crops up. You also have, um, well, there are many questions. You mentioned an important one, that is, will the resources be available? We have 4.3 billion internet addresses. All of them have been allocated. Almost all of them have been assigned. And we haven't gone to the new standard. This has been a big issue for a long time. <clears throat> the, the, uh, yes, I, well, just, just to disclose, I did my doctoral dissertation on the issue of address scarcity and the uh, slow migration to IPv6 and all of the geopolitical tensions around that. But the truth is, here we are in 2014 now, and we still, as a world, have not upgraded to the new standard that would create more addresses. Um, it, was a, it was an engineering decision to not have the new standard backward compatible with the old standard. Why would that be? Because the assumption is that people would upgrade for the good of the internet. It's a classic collection, collective action problem. And I think that will enter into the Internet of Things equation. I hope you do do your dissertation on that. I mean, there's a great deal of enthusiasm about the Internet of Things right now. And my, I probably show a selection bias in that I read a lot of the trade publications. But it seems to me that a lot of it's coming from the commercial sector and about using this stuff for marketing purposes, for harvesting that type of data for affording certain types of mobile commerce applications that are gonna let you, you know, be constantly in connection with the market and so forth. I'm just wondering if, if you, maybe this is unfair to ask you to speculate on this, but do you think it's gonna be built out into basically just a commercial internet of things, that it's, it's about extending the marketplace and everything that we wear and use? I have a much more positive view of it. Okay. Yeah, it's a mood that yeah. I'm in today. I don't know I'm gonna make it here and back before the storm. I'm in a great mood today. I feel like there are huge possibilities for areas like e-health and for you know, financial market efficiency and for the democratic political sphere. I mean, I, I feel like there are great possibilities. I think that we always have the caveats around all of that. 
right? So the, the, the issues that we just mentioned a, a few minutes ago, but I feel like it's going to do more good than harm. among uh, like health organizations, governments, public service, like, sure. do you think that they're going to actually get behind it with the same missionary zeal that PayPal and so forth are? I'll just talk about e-health because I did one um, research project on that with the United Nations uh, a few years back. But the, the ability in parts of the world that don't have the infrastructure that we have or the hospitals to have devices that are connected, um, whether for diagnostic reasons or for um, treatment reasons for remote health care, you know, in, embedded in the, in the health technologies and creating the communication so that people don't have to be there physically. Um, I think that, that, you know, all of the companies that are developing products and the policymakers that are behind that do have that degree of optimism. Again, with the, the, with the caveats of privacy, reliability, exploitation, all of, all of the caveats that we want to ask ab about all new technologies. Thank you very much.